speaker, I think you all know, Susie Lewis. Susie Lewis is principal investigator at the Berkeley Bioinformatics Open Source Project. But as we all know, she is the, one of the founders and also principal investigator of OBO and of the Gene Ontology Consortium. So welcome, Susie Lewis. It's a real pleasure to be here, and, and I really appreciate the opportunity. So just so that we're on the same page, I'm going to describe what I think is an ontology. And it may be different than what you think is an ontology, but w if we could work from that basis, it'll give us a more solid foundation for communications. So for me, what they're useful for. One is for searching. Now, you can get away with using controlled vocabularies for that. But, but ontologies give you a little, uh, quite a bit more because of the hierarchy and the relationships. They're also good for interoperability um, because if people use a common uh, set of semantics, you can communicate with one another. You both know you're talking about the same thing. You add a, a bunch of synonyms in there um, to give you a wider vocabulary, and you, you can get a lot more done as far as interoperability. The other thing is for reasoning, and that to me is the most interesting things, and that's where the, the power of ontologies really come into play. And then I'm going to talk about the Obo Foundry, and just this is sort of like uh, if you're out there as the scout on the frontiers, uh, just like how you get burned. Um, this, these are some of the lessons from the Obo Foundry. And then mostly um, what, we're all here together to see you know, how can we move this forward and what, what more can we do. So why bother? Well, part of the problem is that biologists and the research that we do, I'm coming from genomics, by the way, so I'm much more towards the research end of things than anything in the commercial field, but biologists work with squishy things. And we're now living in a digital world, so there's sort of a, a disparity between those two. There, one is analog, the other is very digital. Um, and the thing is, our old paradigm was that used to be you'd write it down on paper. But more and more, we don't data that's put or results or you know, that's put onto paper isn't accessible. It's not useful. So we have to get it into a computer, and we have to do it in a rigorous way. And so that's kind of what this is about. It's like, where is it? So um, Matt mentioned Go. I have to talk a little bit about Go. So are, are most of you familiar with the European Bioinformatics Institute? It's a big complex in, outside of Cambridge where they do a lot of research. And of course, whenever you are research, uh, resource funded by public money, they want to know, is, are we getting our money's worth? Perfectly valid question. So they hired a consulting firm who did an analysis of what's the impact of of Go as, or not just Go, but all of the EBI resources, but in, in Go in particular, I was happy to learn uh, stood out. And so it's about a three to one ratio, as far as if the money they invested in building this resource and, and creating this ontology, um, the return on the dollar investment was about three dollars. Actually, they were working in pounds, but the ratio still stands. Um, and that you know, there's a lot, it, it's a lot of data. I'm, I myself get somewhat awestruck by how much is downloaded, but people use this stuff. Uh, most of it is for enrichment analyses, where you have a set of unknowns. You say, it, sort of like in Sesame Street, what, <laughs> these things belong together. What is it that they have in common? So you go to your resource that's been classified all the data, using the ontology, you do the enrichment analyses, and you say, ah, this, this is what they have in common. And I think that's a lot of what these resources want to be able to do, is show what's in common. And then just for example, there's knock-on effects too. It's not just people using the data directly from EBI, but like uh, AgBase, which largely does uh, chickens, but also other livestock animals, they've downloaded the Go. They want to know what do these genes do. They provide annotations to Go. And so and they have tens of thousands of users, so we have knock-on effects. If, the more you can get a common terminology that gets widely adopted, the more impact you can have. And then finally, you know, there's also more software gets built around it. Standards lead, standards actually make per, 
our technologies move forward more quickly because you, you've got a baseline that you can work from. You're not building on a foundation of sand. You actually have a standard. Okay, so what is an ontology? Very simple. It's a machine model or representation. It's something a machine can understand that represents the biology. For me, I make a very clear distinction between the instances and the model. The ontology is the model, but what you have, you know, this, this is a table, so I've classified it, but there's tables all around the room. Those are different instances of the table, and I don't conflate the database or the knowledge base with the ontology itself. Um, so what is it? So what, there's really just two parts to it. What kinds of things exist and what are the relationships? So here we have a microbial mat, an alkaline microbial mat to be specific. So this is, so there's different types of relationships. Am I going too slow? Oh, yeah, I was wondering. So it's like I'm talking this screen and I hadn't, and you guys are seeing the little picture of the, yeah, yeah, okay. So, but, um, so microbial mat, it's in it, I'll, I'll look this way, then uh, you can see. Alcohol in hot springs. Now you'll notice I've got, is there a pointer on this thing? Okay, um, this is, uh, there is an ontology called PETO for historical reasons, but it does qualities. So alkalinity is a quality. So this has, the hot spring has the quality of being alkaline. It also is a hot spring, which is a term from the environment ontology. It, actually, all of these are, but we, we're pulling things from different ontologies. So that's just in simplistic terms. I could do this over and over again. Here's the entity. Here's the types of relationships. The relationships are just as important, very important. Um, oh, okay. Um, okay, so why are they needed? They're needed for searching. Here's an example. <laughs> Real data. Real problem, this is from the European nucleotide resource. This is, there is an attribute field that people need to fill in. What's the sex are you working with? This is genetic sex, not reported sex. Um, and so, I mean, just if you had this example, F. Well, in another way, you, is that for female or for father? Um, it's not really clear. Metafemale, I'm actually not quite sure what that is. There's some clear typing mistakes. Those are not bad. There's additional information in here where you're, it's actually telling you two things, both that it's female and the age of that specimen. There's others like it's implied that it's female, um, but you also are getting the species. So they've actually conflated two concepts into one string. And it, mostly it's the irregularity that makes this so impossible for us to really do um, research work. Now, most of us, and I've done this too, we all do it, you, you start with, um, whoops, this button, uh, with mapping. I like, mapping is useful, but I don't think it's the ultimate and final and best solution because you end up with different problems. So, you can have things where you've mapped this, so you've got the string retina, you've got the string retina, these two classes have been mapped together, so it was mapped, is it useful? No, because it's just plain wrong from a biological sense. You also have ones where you do want to have the mapping occur, but there's absolutely nothing in common for the, um, in the string, so hypothesis and pituitary are, from an evolutionary standpoint, both the same piece of anatomy in zebrafish and in mouse, it did not get mapped, but you really would want to, wanted to have seen this. And this is, of course, always one of the favorites of town um, and piece of human anatomy. Those are not strings that you want to have mapped. So these are the kind of issues if you rely on a strictly mapping approach. It gets you part of the way there, but for science, you really need more accuracy. So the other thing is, why do you need ontologies and this button? Um, is for interoperability. And so it, you might draw this as silos. This is from the biodiversity community, but they're having trouble. So we need rigor. So what we know, where to find it, what we can infer from it. That's really what all of this is about. And so these are some of the groups we've been working with um, on different kinds of standards efforts. So interoperability. Now, I don't think there's one ontology to rule us all and one ontology to bind us. I have a completely opposite approach to this, which is that we need to do, use 
our ontologies combinatorically because just from a pure engineering standpoint, the maintenance is impossible if you try to build one great big thing. It's better to be able to do it compositionally. So, for example, um, here we have something that was originally in the Go ontology. Uh, and you'll notice there's a chemical term there, a sugar, actually, hexose. And there's another term that you can, you can distinguish these. Again, it's like in the example with female child, where we had two concepts mixed together. So, and if you look at the whole uh, hierarchy here, we actually went from a hexose to a monosaccharide to a sugar to a carbohydrate. We have an implied uh, chemical ontology within the GO ontology. And this suddenly dawned on us that we had an impl implicit ontology embedded with an, another ontology. And so the idea is that they're luckily, well actually because we talked to them and we got it started, there is now a chemical uh, entity, chemical entities of biological interest, KEBI, that's uh, built by the EBI, um, which holds chemicals. And then we've got basic um, molecular roles in Go, and that's what we've redone Go so that in the logical, the computable definitions of all the Go terms, we refer both to KEBI and to uh, some basic molecular function. Okay, here's another one for interoperability. We want to be able to go across species. Someone, we were talking about diseases earlier. Well, a lot of what's done in it to understand the basic mechanisms of human disease is because of um, what you can start le learn in model systems such as zebrafish and mouse. But we needed a way to rigorously using computationally to be able to compare these. So we, we, there's an ontology, whoops, 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 back, 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 back. Um, an ontology for interoperability so we can, we can actually rigorously say that uh, uh, ear in human anatomy is, is a, it, there's some relationship to ear in zebrafish and zebra in mouse. And we can actually go down farther and farther. So, it's so we've got a species neutral way that we can map across uh, organisms to actually get phenotypic information and disease information from these model <laughs> systems. So, and this is being, again, this compositional approach where uh, from the clinical standpoint, Palmer, Palmer plantar hyperkeratosis is in the logical definition is composed of a term from PATO, increased, term from go, keratinization, from uberon stratum corneum layer of the skin, and autopod. So together, this defines the single term in the human phenotype ontology. And so that's it. So that basically for interoperability by having a more compositional approach buys you a whole lot, both in terms of maintainability, but also being able to pull in from a wide variety of data sources, not just the one, the one that you've built. And the final thing is for, um, as far as why we need ontologies is for inference. So somebody was mentioning, you know, where am I going to eat? I'm hungry. What, what's out, out there? And if you look on the awning, there's a lot, nice little ontology there to tell you. So the, um, they facilitate inference. So I can see that, you know, it's telling me the type of cuisine that is Chinese and that it's presumably there's the country flag. So I have a mapping between those two. Um, so I have, I can, I can support inference. The problem is, if we're not doing it correctly, um, we can make incorrect inferences. So I might say that delicatessen food comes from Canada, and that fresh juice is the national cuisine of Sweden, um, and that the flag of, that's the flag of fresh juice, and that frozen yogurt is a, is a cuisine in search of a national identity. Um, it's just, you, you can, if you don't get your ontologies right, your inferences are going to be wrong. And so it's very important. And so to, to build your ontologies accurate, accurately. So what we know of the biology. So it's just, this is the same thing I'm, I've been saying over and over, but the, you know, it's a computable representation. And if it's gonna reason over it correctly, we've gotta get it modeled correctly. So here's one of the things we're doing in Go. I'll go, I'm, I think I might skip this really quickly, but phylogenetic duplication speciation, all of the nodes have persistent identifiers. We've got experimental data in a very, a very sparse number. Green is where there's experimental data. Sometimes you 
they do the experiment and they discover it's not there, but we can indicate if, uh, where there's been loss of function, we can, we can annotate the ancestral protein, and then we can propagate it um, down and know where cholinesterase developed. So we're doing this for GO so that basically we're annotating protein family by protein family as opposed to protein by protein, a lot more efficient. Um, and it takes, it's a click and drag sort of web interface. So that's just a little tool. Um, we're also using, we're also working with the Monarch Initiative uh, and a group in uh, Australia for doing, using medical, um, medical inferencing so that we're using uh, from, again, large head migranathi. Uh, these are from uh, the Uber ontology that we were talking about. All of these are coming together, though. So you're beginning to get a layout of doing this compositionally. So here's the oboe foundry. It's a set of bio, it's a, it's a family of ontologies that are designed to work together. It's, it's basically a tight connection, compatibility, interoperability, shared relationships. That's a big one the, because that's what's used for the inference and to support logic-based reasoning. So if you look across the top, we have things that, that continue, you know, that exist over time, like the table is a solid thing. So we have that are independent. You have dependent, like organ function can't exist without an organ to, to, to function in. Um, you have things that occur over time, um, processes. So that's you know, sort of like, is it a solid continuing thing or is it just sort of something that occurs? And then you have granularity, you can go down to the molecular level and up to the organismal level. So just sort of examples of ontologies. Here, we're working with the I5K project with USDA. They're sequencing 5,000 insect genomes and they're using the sequence ontology implied in the tool they're doing for structural annotation of genes. Um, we're working with Pankaj Jaswal on plantiome, on phenotypes, types. And we're working, uh, the ANVO is being used for a lot of global sampling surveys where they're going to the Antarctic and looking at the microbes there, doing ocean, ocean and also soil samples. Um, that was actually the group in Australia I just got back from talking to them. And so that's sort of the thing. The other thing that, so it's trying to get all of these things to cover that sort of grid of biology. And also, as far as infrastructure, what, it, what the Obo Foundry provides is just there's a registry. You have to find things. If you want to know what ontologies are out there, this is a place where you can register. You, you can go in and do it yourself. Just register your ontology. It doesn't take us. Uh, it's just a YAML page that you can edit. Uh, the pearls, again, this makes it traceable. Per, using a persistent um, URL makes it a little bit easier to find because you have a resolver in case the website goes down. Um, central versioning, in case you don't have enough cloud storage for your own ontology, there's a way you can have, we can, that can be managed. There's best practices, basically lessons learned from ontology building. These can be improved um, with lessons learned from all of you, software tools, so some of these things just for the pure production. And we're, you know, just trying to build community, um, which I think is one, perhaps mo the most important. Um, and the guidelines help. Uh, so I was talking before about instances and classes, and it's sort of like if, if your ontology is, it's difficult to find the right term, people are going to use the wrong term because they want to get on with their curation, their classification, their annotation. It's just they've got to be easy to understand. And of course, to the machine so that you can do the reasoning and searching. Um, and it makes it easier for the curators. If you're trying to get more people to actually use your ontologies, the better, the, the more obvious and intuitive and common sense your ontologies are, the more likely people are to, you know, the more quickly people can learn and adopt them. Um, and it also just by keeping them based, very, these sort of rudimentary ontologies that you use in combination to build a, a application ontology, it makes it easier. Um, and so all of this, you know, just if you can follow some basic guidelines and we go, go through a few just little simple ones. All of these are but initiation from different communities. So if you're talking to someone from dentistry or you're talking to a yeast biologist or you're talking to someone with plants, they all call this but initiation. So it's simple enough. You have, you, you just basically add a qualifier at the beginning of your class label um, and then add the synonym. So that's not... But, but then the other thing is to stay positive. We try to stay away from negation things. 
If you say that it's not a rabbit, that sort of includes everything in the universe because <laughs> everything else is not a rabbit, so we try to stay away from negation in our classes. Uh, the other thing that we try to keep it real, um, so this is not a pipe, this is a painting of a pipe. Um, and the same thing, you know, no unicorns, preferably, um, if they're going to be useful for things. The relationships, they have to be defined because the kind of inference you make from ISA or part of, you know, a chloroplast membrane is part of the chloroplast is quite different from it. Uh, is a relationship where, where you're saying a chloroplast membrane is a kind of membrane. So we have it's very useful for when you're drawing inferences to, to be clear on these distinctions. Um, and click. So here's just some of the kinds of relationships that we have. So just some examples. Um, you know, contribute for genophenol in disease is a risk factor. <coughs> correlates with marker for all that kind of thing. You can go over these later, but. It's the relation. I can't harp enough on how the relationships are very important. Uh, definitions. Uh, you know, everybody gets hung up on how you name the classes, but please don't do that. It's all in the definition for, for the computers, the computable, and then the readable, um, and then working together. So people. You know, historically, it's people talking to people, mind meld. Um, but now we talk through computers. And so we've got to share our computer representation. If we're going to communicate and share and have interoperable data, we have to share it. And so I just, you know, it's in, and college development is inherently collaborative. It's inherently about, inherently about building community. And it's also, um, ontologies in the abstract just don't work. Um, so you really have to build it to purpose. So I'm going to, I'm going to two more slides, I think, and I'm done. One is like, here's a real world thing with sort of ontologies underneath. But what we're working on right now in my group is a new piece of software that I hope people might find useful, which is, the name of the software is Noctua, which it means little owl in Greek, um, because it's owl based. And it's, it's like a graph based Google, kind, Google Docs-y kind of thing that you can draw your ontology. But the thing is, this is all underlined. The, every relationship here is drawn from the relationship ontology. Every little box or anaton is, um, is, is, is one of the entities that we're talking about. And the thing is, you know, more than one place in the world can work on it at the same time. It dynamically pushes it out to everybody who happens to be looking at it. And so, and it can be exported in the OWL and do all the RDF Sparkle semantic web stuff. So, um, we, you know, we'd be interested in working with groups who might want to use this tool for um, their annotation processes. And I think that's it. Thanks for having me here, and I'm looking forward to talking to everybody.